Hi, this is Emily Castleton and Enrico Genschel from Iowa State University. Um, and today we're going to talk about some materi teaching materials that were developed that introduced metrology into an intro steps course. So um, the next slide. Um, we'll start off by talking about some background and motivation for developing the materials. Um, and then we'll, in the interest of time, just present and discuss a small subset of the teaching materials. So you can think of this webinar as kind of a teaser to entice you to go read our JSE article, which is referenced uh, down at the bottom. Um, and in this article, we have the complete course materials that were developed and information about the pilot study where the materials were introduced into an interest staff course at Iowa State. And then hopefully once you read the article, um, then you'll want to use this material in your own intro class. Uh, so the background and motivation for this material um, came out of a course taught at Iowa State for junior level engineering students that had more advanced materials. Um, and so engineering student, students are obviously more concerned with uh, data quality. But we thought we could simplify this material and generalize it to a broader audience and put it into an interest stats course. So the intention of using this material in an interest stats course was to increase the student's understanding of variability and their perception of the usefulness of statistics. And the way that we try to do this is by taking statistical, statistical concepts that were familiar to them in their everyday lives um, and applying them uh, those examples to the statistical concepts. Um, metrology is all about measurements, and so students take measurements every day, whether it's stepping on a scale to seeing how much they weigh or pumping gas into their car. So because this is something that's very familiar to students, um, we were able to relate the concepts back to that. And also it is relevant to other introductory um, hard sciences, such as biology, chemistry, and physics. So the complete set of materials that were developed were two lectures that were about 60 minutes each and two corresponding activities. In the pilot study, um, these activities were completed in groups of size three to five, and it took them about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, the exercises could be modified slightly if you wanted to do them as individual work or assign them as homework. Uh, the takeaways from lecture one is just to introduce some basic terminology. And what I feel was the most impactful aspect of this material was to get students to just acknowledge that measurement error existed. And then in the first lecture, to keep things simple, uh, we talk about measurement error for just a single measurement and how to report that. And then in the second lecture, we get into measurement error from sets of measurements, which leads naturally into how measurement error affects experimentation. So a small snippet of material from lecture one. Uh, we start out with the definition of metrology as the science of measurement and talk about how metrology is actually a profession. And I think that knowing that metrology is a science and a profession justifies uh, its importance. Um, we also talk, this material focuses on measurement error, which is just a subset of metrology, but there is uh, more to metrology than just measurement error. And then we list the learning objectives for the whole set of material as a kind of simple set of questions that can we return to later. So we start out with a motivating example that most students can relate to, um, since most, if not all, have had their blood pressure checked at some point. Um, and in this scenario, students are at a doctor's visit. They have one slightly high uh, blood pressure reading. Um, and to be put on blood pressure medicine is not a decision to, make, to be made lightly. It's very expensive and it is a lifelong commitment. So your doctor proposes that you return every day the following week and have your blood pressure taken um, with three different devices. Um, so on the next slide, we present the students with the result of this experiment, all 15 blood pressure measurements. And we asked them to consider what they would do if they were presented with only a subset of the measurements. So for example, the first question is, if their appointment was only on Thursday and they were only given these three measurements, um, they may consider taking the medicine or at least making some lifestyle adjustment. If only device three was used, they may think their blood pressure was fine. Or if only the one high reading on Tuesday was used, they may consider start taking the pills. We then ask a hopefully hypothetical question of why aren't all the numbers the same? Because um, it should be obvious that um, the day of time, the device, and the nurse all affect what the value of the blood pressure is. 
Uh, the next part of the lecture, we go into just some definitions and examples. Uh, we talk about recognizing variability, the measure and as the thing for which we are trying to establish a true correct value, uh, measurement, the result of the measurement process, um, talk about meaningful units of measurement, which is important in any type of taking measurements, um, and then define the device and operator since these are things that will impact the measurement error. We then go on to define measurement error for just a single measurement, um, and we define that by the amount by which each observed measurement differs from the true but unknown value. And we purposely do not show this as a subtraction formula because the true value um, is one that would be acquired by a perfect measurement or a device with infinite precision, which we can never get, it's never known. So we don't show it as a formula since there is a term in there that can never be known. So we think of measurements as only approximations to the true value of the measure and. And so this, like many other concepts in the material, has connections to other things that are typically taught in an intro staff course. So kind of the relationship between measurements and the true value of the measure and um, can be related back to parameter and statistic. Um, we also talk about reference standards. Um, this kind of relates to this meaningful units of measurement. Um, and here we're just showing some kind of cool examples of reference standards and how they're defined. <coughs> um, concepts that are pretty similar or pretty familiar to students as in second or kilogram, um, but kind of what they actually mean. And then to finish up the lecture, we talk about how to report a single measurement. Um, since we don't know, measurements are not exact values, they're only approximations. We need to convey that uncertainty in how we report a single measurement. And so we do that as an interval. <clears throat> um, so if we have a measurement device for which there is a calibration, we use that. If there's no stated calibration, then we assume that the last digit is inaccurate. And this is a common practice in chemistry, physics, other disciplines like that. <laughs> um, so that was a small snippet of material from lecture one. In the corresponding group activity, uh, students are presented with two scenarios. The first, they're placed as the role of a quality worker at Betty Crocker, where they're asked to weigh the brownie mix that comes in the boxes that you buy at the grocery store. And they determine the weight with a balanced and calibrated masses. And the reason that we use this device um, is for two reasons. It, one, it clearly demonstrates the finite precision of the measurement, because at some point you just run out of smaller calibrated masses. And also, it does a good job of um, naturally presenting measurements as an interval, since uh, measurements are usually in between two calibrated masses. Uh, in the second scenario, students have a more serious job of weighing the active ingredient of aspirin at a pharmaceutical company. Now they're weighing this with a digital scale with increasing number of decimal places. And so with this, again, um, although the scale is a lot more fancy and probably costs more money, um, students should see that at some point you can't get, not get any more precise. You just run out of decimal places. So I'll turn this over to uh, Eureka Gantrell. Okay. So I will talk about the content of Lecture 2 and then also briefly about the group activity that we have following Lecture 2. And if time permits, we'll briefly look at some of the results that we obtained from our pilot study. So the main purpose of Lecture 2 is how to interpret the information that we get when we actually don't have just one measurement, but a set of measurements, and especially how measurement error then in turn affects experimentation. And so similarly to what we did in Lecture 1, we have sort of a motivating example that we're going to reference throughout the lecture notes and use to introduce and discuss the different concepts. And we give a little bit of background, and for this example, the main goal is actually to estimate the average rate of a textbook that students are required, let's say, to bring to school. So we walk students through some of the things they may have seen or should have seen already early in the semester, hopefully. We talk about this idea of getting a sampling frame set up and um, then using, let's say, a random number, gen number generator to get a random sample of 50 textbooks. And then we have to weigh the textbooks, and we have to take the average of all 50 measurements to get the average weight. Now, based on what students learn already from the first lecture, um, we know there exists measurement error, and we know that every measurement is only an approximation to the true weight of a sample textbook. 
But because we have multiple measurements now, we can also address this idea that um, there is measurement error that's not just coming from the textbook variability or the different textbooks, but also um, other sources of variability such as measurement error coming from the scale. In this case, we would call this measurement error due to the device. And so taking into account this additional source of variability, ultimately what can we say about the true weight, average weight of the textbooks? So the lecture notes continue with briefly reminding students of how measurement error was defined when we had a single measurement and um, how we reported and acknowledged measurement error. We did this by providing an interval. But it's pretty obvious that when we have multiple measurements, that's no longer very feasible. So for a set of measurements, it would be pretty awkward to have a list of intervals. But the good thing is, it's also no longer necessary. So rather than focusing on what in this case was not practical, um, we now shift the emphasis and start the discussion where we'll use the benefits of having multiple measurements in the sense that we can think of our set of measurements to provide us with information not only about the measurement itself, but also about the measurement process. And sort of use this or interpret this as bonus information that we get from our collected data. Now coming back to the textbook example, what this applies in our context here is we don't just get information about the true average weight of the sample textbooks, but we also get information about the average amount of measurement error that's coming from the scale. So naturally that we actually have introduced these two or started the discussion of having two different sources of variability, um, we have to look at the data and our average and we realize what the students realize the average is only one value that we have. So how is it that we actually can separate out these two sources of variability and actually learn something about both the measurement and the measurement process? And that naturally leads into this idea of what in statistics we often refer to as having different variance components. And so for the first time in the lecture notes, we will um, show students that we actually can separate out the entire variability or express the total variability as the sum of the variability that's due to the different textbooks plus the variability that is due to the scale. Now in the lecture notes we purposely set up this example in such a way that we actually indeed only have one observation on each book so there are no replications and in turn, of course, this is going to result in the dilemma that there's no way for us to actually separate out um, the two different variance components. And so we use this or we did this on, on purpose in the sense that we are now in a position where we can engage the students into a discussion. What we would have to do um, in terms of modifying our experiment in such a way that we can learn information about the variability that's coming from the scale, but also information on the variability that's from the measure, coming from the measurements. So essentially, we'll ask the students, um, how would you collect a set of values that would allow us to address each of the variance, estimation of each of the variance components? Now this is, in the lecture notes, this is going to lead us to this discussion of um, that there always are different sources for variability and we start this discussion of identifying factors that could contribute to the overall variability in our measurements. And ideally, we want to not only reduce the effect of these factors, but we also ideally want to learn a little bit about um, how they contribute to the variability of the measurements. Um, in the context of 
the previous example on the textbooks, but also for our capstone example to follow, we distinguish between controllable factors and uncontrollable factors, and um, we introduced this idea that you can control certain factors and we can repeat, we can generate replicates in our experiment, but we also um, may have factors that are controllable and are not, cannot be repeated. And then last but not least, of course, also, we typically are in a situation where we have uncontrollable factors. And we'll say more about that in the next slides. Nevertheless, um, we'll make this point that even with a great experimental design and um, regardless of how much data in the end we will have available, um, we'll never be able to actually know the true value of the measurement itself with complete certain, certainty, but that we can at least get reasonably close. Okay, so that gets back to this idea of the true value always remains unknown, um, but we can use a set of multiple measurements to actually learn more about the true value of the measurement with some amount of certainty. So the most common factors usually are um, variability coming from your device that you're going to use from, let's say, the operator, that is the people who are taking the measurements, and then very often surrounding physical circumstances such, let's say, your temperature or humidity, for example. Now, in the lecture notes, because this is at the introductory level and really one of the most important um, goals for us was for students to not only recognize that there's always measurement error, but also to acknowledge it and to start thinking about different sources of variability. We really continued our discussion, or yeah, we continue at a very conceptual level. This would be the place where you probably could, at a higher level, introduce some more technical details in terms of how you estimate specifically these different variance components. But we purposely stayed away from any formulas and uh, rather used sort of a capstone example as an illustration and um, provided the results from this capstone data analysis and interpreted the results. So the example or the concluding example of the lecture notes is set up in such a way that at the end we will be able to go back and discuss the learning objectives with the students. Um, in this example, this is a cereal company. They are producing cereal boxes. And of interest here is measuring the width of the boxes. And so the way the experiment is set up is that we have um, obviously the part that's to be measured. And we have 10 parts altogether. So we have 10 cereal boxes. We have two different devices, we'll just call them device one, device two, and then we have three different operators, Pat, Gavin, and Brandon. And so the measurement scenario is the following. Let's say for one of the operators, Pat, um, he randomly chooses a device, let's say device one, and he randomly chooses one of the ten boxes and measures the box and gets a measurement. And then he repeats this process until there are measurements for all of the 10 boxes. Specifically, we have each of the boxes measured three times with each of the devices by PET. And then the same scenario for the other two operators. So altogether, for one of the operators, we have 60 measurements. For all three together, we have combined 180 measurements. So identifying the factors in this case, we have operator, device, part and we start a discussion with the students. Um, what are the different sources of variability and what can we actually estimate? And so for the device, we can think about between and within device variability. Because we have three operators, likewise we can consider between and within variability. Um, we can look at the parts to parts variability. And then last but not least, also other sources that we were not able to control or simply that were not known to us at the time. So I think our analysis back we did in JUMP using JUMP, so the output, the plot that you see is actually generated in JUMP, um, will show students the results. 
namely exactly this pie chart that represents or provides information on each of the variance components, the proportion, specifically the amount of variability that is due to each of the components. And we can see the majority of the variability actually comes from the parts, and there's only very little due to the operators. And hopefully then we'll be able to discuss with students certain questions, you know, what what could happen or based on these results, is it reasonable maybe to use only one measuring device or should we only use one operator? Or if we were able to improve, let's say, one thing in this entire experiment, which one should we focus on? So our lecture slides continue and then conclude with um, discussing each of the learning objectives that Emily had mentioned in the beginning of the presentation and um, discuss these learning objectives in the context of this question. So the group activity, I'm just going to talk briefly because I see we're already short on time. Um, this group activity, we focused on measurements of distances and time. And so we chose two landmarks, I think in the article we chose the Lincoln Memorial in Washington DC and the White House, the difference and also the distance and also the time it takes to travel between the two um, landmarks. And we asked students to use three different sets of directions from three different sources. And specifically one of the questions is asking students for a given scenario um, to choose the most likely sources of variability. So here, let's say, if you repeat the trip three times, each time you're using a different set of directions, but you're always measuring the travel time with the same stopwatch. So what variance components could be estimated? Now, one of the questions that we ask and we were sort of prompted to from earlier research is, um, is it possible to obtain, with complete certainty, an exact measurement equal to the true value of the measurement for the distance between the two landmarks? And then the same question, but this time with respect to time. And so the interesting finding, and uh, most of the, yeah, to me, pretty much the most interesting finding in this study, in terms of feedback from the students, was that there was a clear distinction in how students thought about measures of distance and how students thought about measures of time. Um, specifically, they did think that it was possible to get a perfect measurement for distance, but not for time. And pretty much the majority of the um, responses from the students we could summarize, or are perfectly summarized by this statement where the student wrote, it's not possible to get the exact measurement for time due to outside variables such as traffic and weather. However, distance can be measured given the exact start and top stop points. So that was kind of a bummer at the end of the study that, or at the end of this lab when we had this group activity that there were still some things that students were not completely clear about. Um, in detail in um, the paper, we saw a positive feedback, we saw positive feedback from the students um, because we only had one study. We want to point out it was fairly, everything was fairly descriptive in terms of statistical analyses. Um, but the, overall the feedback that we had received from students was positive. So with that, I'd like to um, thank everyone for listening, and we're open to questions now. One of the questions that came in was, where are the teaching materials to be found? They are, if you go to the uh, JSC article, um, there is, I think, on page 7, uh, if you click, there's some links in there. And that will take you to all of the teaching materials. OK. Um, I don't see any further questions uh, as being listed. You guys must have done a great job covering the material. I want to thank you for a great presentation. And that our next webinar will be Tuesday, May 12th at noon with Stacy Casey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.